it's about to get weird. Yeah. Er. So this is Vanessa Place, um, born in 1968, BA at UMass Amherst, MFA at Antioch University, and JD at Boston University. I know, wait till, wait till you hear, yeah. Uh, co-director of Le Figue Press here in Los Angeles, and a criminal defense attorney, and a novelist. Um, yeah, you're going to like her, I hope. <laughs> so um, here are her works. And uh, let me say a little bit about some of these. So Le Figue Press quote, publishes experimental writing and literature and translation with a focus on feminist and queer authors here in Los Angeles. Uh, and the press partnered with the Los Angeles Review of Books in 2017 and has its own imprint print series there. Uh, and she, Vanessa Place, currently edits the Global Poetics series at LA Review of Books. She is indeed a criminal defense attorney. She represents indigent sex offenders on appeal. So sex offenders who cannot afford a lawyer, Vanessa Place becomes their attorney. So being an artist, a novelist and an artist and all kinds of things, she um, has a performance piece called Last Words, um, which relates to her legal work. Well, first of all, she uses courtroom materials uh, in her works. In fact, there's uh, one of her works there, or three of her works there, Trago Tragodia, is, um, let's see, uh, courtroom materials. Um, Statement of fact, statement of the case, and the argument. It's an appropriation of her own legal writing on appellate briefs for these indigent sex offenders. Um, and she frames it as a response to Dante's Divine Comedy. I know. Um, she's also produced something called Last Words. Um, <laughs> that reproduces the last statements of all inmates executed in Texas since 1982. This is a creative work. Um, the work occurs in a context in which the listener realizes that speaking becomes the pronunciation of one's own death sentence. So yeah, it's going to be light and easy tonight. Uh, so let's talk about La Medusa, which is um, this book. As you can see, it's quite thick, 488 pages, very small print, right? As you look at when you're a student, right? Oh my God, it's very small font. And uh, what is this book? Well, there's nothing quite like this book I've ever seen. I think it's it's a unique depiction of Los Angeles, and we'll talk more about that. But, for, but let's ease into it. First of all, it's a literary collage. So Stephanie Sobel in Bomb Magazine writes that La Medusa is, and she's right, voices of television shows, screenplays, and medical books juxtaposed with the intimate narratives of a rebellious young girl a doctor performing an infant cranial surgery, a corpse accounting for his own death, he was changing a tire on the 405, and a truck driver on the road with his wife. That's the novel. It is in Los Angeles uh, and other places. Okay, Los Angeles, yes, we hear you. These characters travel in cars and semis on freeways and boulevards through Silver Lake and Beverly Hills, Venice Beach, and the Mojave Desert. It is multivocal. So 
again, I'm going to struggle tonight explaining this novel. Um, you won't hear me quote from it because it wouldn't make any sense if I quoted passage because the novel is all and a self-contained thing uh, that's reflecting in on itself, kind of like the inside of a disco ball. That's what this novel is. Um, and then there is Medusa. And you know Medusa from um, various ancient sources, especially Ovid's Metamorphoses. Medusa was a beautiful woman in service to Athena at her temple. And Poseidon, seeing her in the field, uh, was attracted to her and came out of the sea and raped her in Athena's temple. <clears throat> so as things were in the ancient world, and maybe still are in some ways, the victim was punished for the crime, and so became Medusa, the, the gorgon, the snake-headed figure that you know from mythology. Uh, and it was said that those, in fact, it was it's in the story, that those who looked upon her were turned to stone. All right, so um, <laughs> I'd love to do a whole thing on Medusa, and we've done a couple of things on Medusa before, but um, that's the reference for the novel. And Medusa, La Medusa, L.A. Medusa, right, is the city, but not quite that simply. Uh, the novel begins with every epic begins with a look in the mirror. And so what that's referring to is Perseus, the hero who comes and slays Medusa by not looking at her directly, but he's given, he's prepared, the gods prepare him, um, outfit him with this great um, setup. And, and, one, and part of the setup is a shield. And the shield is so polished that it reflects. And so rather than look at Medusa, he looks at her, he guides himself to her through her reflection in the shield and beheads her. And it gets so weird. So as soon as he beheads her, a couple of figures come out, uh, a beautiful man, um, and then a horse. <laughs> okay, uh, the horse is uh, called Pegasus, Pegasus, and then Perseus will ride Pegasus all over. He goes and rescues Andromeda, and, and if he gets in trouble, he just holds Medusa's head out, you know, and people start turning to stone. There's so much to this myth and so much to this city. It's, it's kind of a natural uh, connection. Uh, for example, uh, Perseus when he cut off Medusa's head and flew away on Pegasus, the winged horse. This was in Africa, and so blood dropped on the ground, and the myth says that that's why there are so many snakes in Africa. Um, but for Vanessa Place, there's no better symbol for the city than Medusa, a place that you can't quite look at, and yet you must look at. Um, it casts and cements the gaze of you as others see you, according to the text. It casts and cements the gaze of you as others see you. So it's a mirror, right? So you're being reflected in someone else's eyes. Um, the title then refers to the city, of course, or as she writes, Place writes, a clusterfuck, this corralled thing a series of conjoined colonies, a city with no downtown. And so the novel is like that. It, it's the chaptering and concentration of unrelated but adjacent, adjacent segments. This is why I cannot summarize it really or even um, quote from it. It's like trying to describe LA using one um, part of the city. Los Feliz. LA is Los Feliz. No, it's not. It's, that's way too small. 
And besides, LA is not the sum of its parts. It's more than the sum of its parts, isn't it? And that's what she's trying to get to in this amazing novel. Every epic begins with a look in the mirror. So this is, this is a look in the mirror, but it's, it's L.A. looking at itself through the eyes of these diverse and strange characters uh, and its signs, signs. It's semiotics, right? The, the things that we all see and process, the information that we take in as we move through this city uh, is all that. And it's all being reflected. So let me just give you a sense of the typography of the book. So there's the intro of the line I quoted. Every epic begins with a look in the mirror. So you'll see there's a lot of white space there. And that's by design. Um, Vanessa Place is an artist, and so she's very interested in, you know, what Coleridge would call negative capability. <clears throat> Just the use of, of empty space, if nothing else, of white space. Um, and then here's, here's an, I think this is the very next page. So another intro. Yeah. And by the way, I, I, what I didn't include is this photograph of a brain. So a brain speaks <laughs> throughout the novel. It's one of the characters. Um, that actually, different parts of the brain speak. Um, so what this line says is, Dr. Casper Bowles eyes his mirrored visor. These are the some of the characters. Fina checks her pink Barbie mirror with Othele, her mother looks at, while Othele, her mother looks at her own hand. So see this image, of, this metaphor of reflection is everywhere. Jorge can't see shit because of the sun. And the golden-bellied woman stands blind as a proverbial bat. Then there's me, flattening and sweep, weeping in 101 windows. That's La Medusa me, the city, flattening and weeping in 101 windows. Reflections, it's all about reflections. There's more brains, <laughs> brains. Uh, there's the pineal gland and what it does. And again, this has a voice, this parts of the brain. They have a voice in the novel. There's some more typography again. So it's much of it is set up as a screenplay with directions like in our scene settings interior skull like i said this is the brain talking um and it's continuous so it's throughout and then i don't honestly know what's happening <laughs> but that is part of the point point. and then you can see um there's like a grocery list or something that's needed, pears, um, pre-sifted boric acid birthmarks and two partridges. <laughs> Sounds like a drunken night, right? <laughs> it's like 3 a.m. Man, we got to get some partridges, right? Um, and boric acid. Uh, um, and then again, here's interior, Casper Bowles, his car during the day. And there's, there is no obvious connection between these sections. And this is one of my favorites, um, a billboard from the church of inadvertent joy. Inadvert, like accidental joy. <laughs> You know, we're chartered as a church here because uh, Manley Hall was actually a minister uh, when he first came to Los Angeles. So maybe we could be this church. No, not a cult. <laughs> if we were in a cult, I'd be a lot richer. <laughs> so you can see here's interior, Fina's kitchen, mid-city, day. That's about the only direction you get is these screenplay directions. And then I don't know what this is from the Church of Inadvertent Joy, 
the exoskeleton is carved according to the facade, right, the right etched with beautiful shallow patterns, etc. Uh, the, the only thing I can say is that the connections emerge. They emerge in the process of reading, and they are obviously fluid um, and highly personal. Like, you'll make the connections. She's not going to make the connections for you. And in fact, this, you'll see later that this is an important part of her artistic philosophy is that she's not going to let you do anything. I mean, she's not going to tell you to do anything or to think anything. She's going to set up these potential relationships and let you connect them as the reader or the viewer. So um, I want to use some other people who are better at explaining this book, like Jacqueline Davis in Book Slut. I love this description. La Medusa is an innovative take on typography, littered with visual stimulants, not just a catchy Hollywood sign and white trash redemption bumper stickers, but much more, which you've already seen. Uncharted geographies, filmic directives, fade in, geometric voids, literary references, Joan Didion noted the city burning as Los Angeles' deep, deepest image of itself. Phrenological definitions uh, about the head. Cingulate silcus is implicated in spontaneous emotion. In an induction site for amygdala involved with pain effect, etc. Um, the, the parts of the brain, like I said. Um, what else is in here? And playful emoticons. <laughs> Unsolved equations. Infinities. Pi. Concrete po poetry. Conditional ad libs. And islands of embedded sensualism. Uh, for example, I live for love, which lives for this kiss. And, um, the Latin is, here lies Narcissus. Okay, so Narcissus and Medusa, that's an interesting pairing. Uh, palettes of psychologically ambiguous ink blots, like the brain, the brain images, but then they move into these amorphous, uh, as she says, the ambiguous ink blots. Unfinished scientific charts, genius, right? Unfinished charts. Practical questions with fantastical answers. Unnerving rows of floating ellipses. Right justified free verse. Bilingual imperative lists. Or things you will need. Revised mythologies, flirtations. I'm yours, you've got me, baby, so put your arms around me, call me baby. And fairy tale interludes such as this. Once upon a time called now, a beautiful woman floated above a choppy holographic sea. She had a hole in her bright belly from which two children fell. One continued falling down to the blue, and salt water suffused his nose and mouth and sand sprinkled through his golden hair like broken bits of light. And the child laughed as he sank to the bed of dancing weeds he was born to spread. And the other child did not laugh, but smiled quietly as she turned perfectly pink and daringly disappeared. Okay. So. The novel's omnipresent perspective. So the narrator, or at least there's not really a narrator, but the, the implied narrator here is omnipresent, sees everything, and is linked to the motivations of the characters um, only through, like I said, only through the reader's perception. So she, there's no leading. There's barely a plot. Is there a correlation between the phrenological anatomies, the brain stuff, 
And the literary content of each subject, subsection? We don't know. Or are these sections only a metaphor for the city's overlapping inscapes? Inscapes. So, escapes to get out of, inscapes to get into. This is difficult to answer, says Jacqueline Davis in Book Slut. I don't think it's that hard to answer. I think it's the city. It is the city. Um, it's a metaphor for the city, but, it, but the city is also conscious in this novel. Los Angeles is conscience, conscious and reflecting on herself. So, it is a polyphonic, many-voiced novel of post-conceptual consciousness. What, what the hell is post-conceptual consciousness? Well, we kind of yearn for post-conceptual consciousness, right? We, we yearn to get out of the, the prison house of language, as Frederick Jameson called it. We yearn to escape from that. Well, if you want out, this is kind of what it looks like. <laughs> uh, you, you can't escape it. You can't escape language, except of course, through silence, I would argue that you can't escape it then because there's an interior monologue going on, or dialogue even. But um, Eileen Sixou talks about this in, interestingly enough, in an essay called The Laugh of the Medusa. What does it mean to ride a woman's body, she asks. And it means not writing in a linear fashion, not writing in a conceptual way. Right? Where, you can, where you can see the ideas and say, oh, okay, I see that. And that idea naturally leads to this idea. That's post you can't have that. That's conceptual consciousness. For post-conceptual consciousness, you have fragments, reflecting other fragments, interacting with other voices, and, and not just voices, but signs. And in fact, all of it being a part of this uber character called La Medusa or Los Angeles. Um, uh, Jacqueline Davis says, at the heart of the whole of this novel floats Medusa, an androgynous central awareness. See, it's not even a character. It's an androgynous central awareness that anchors the novel throughout. It doesn't anchor it, but it's there. I think that's too much. It's not anchored. La Medusa is at once the city of Los Angeles with its snaking freeways and serpentine shifts between reality and illusion, and a brain, a modern mind that is both expansive and penetrating in its obsessions and perceptions. So, okay, <laughs> think about this. Los Angeles as a mind, right, as a brain that becomes a mind, um, what would it be, right? It would be mentally ill, right? I mean, it would be too many voices not interacting with each other and finding no, no network that would connect it all, no series of relationships that would help make sense of it which is what we're doing, what we've been doing for 10 weeks, is trying, is looking at these various images, these various parts of the brain of Los Angeles, and we haven't seen many connections. We can make connections, and maybe we'll try to later on tonight. But this is about post-conceptual awareness, and this is right in line with Vanessa Place's um, artistic philosophy. I love this line. Vanessa places characters, a trucker and his wife, a nine-year-old saxophonist, an ice cream vendor, a sex worker, and a corpse, among others, are borderless selves in a borderless city. Borderless, I love that line. Borderless selves in a borderless city. A city impossible to contain. Her expert ventriloquism an explosive imagination anchor this epic narrative in language that is fierce and vibrant, a, 
I don't know if it's fierce and bright, vibrant, but it's unique. A penetrating cross-section of contemporary Los Angeles and a cross-section of the modern mind. It sh Lama Dusa is, and I've, heard, I've read interviews with her where she doesn't, she doesn't deny this, but I, it, it clearly wasn't in her mind when she wrote it, but she doesn't deny this interpretation. That it is Joyce's Ulysses for Los Angeles. So you remember Joyce's Ulysses, the story of um, Stephen Daedalus who wanders around Dublin in a day, right? And he meets all kinds of characters and, and it's, it's an allusion to the Odyssey, Ulysses, the Odyssey, of course, but it's set in 20th century Dublin. This is Ulysses, I can see it, set in 21st century Los Angeles. Well, what would you encounter if you were a sojourner walking around the city uh, of Los Angeles? First of all, She's not going to let you do that. She's going to have several characters, including a brain, um, interacting because that's an important distinction between Ulysses and La Medusa is that for Joyce, of course, the modernist writer, there's going to be an individual. There's going to be a subject, a single subject, an individual moving around. And, and as unconventional and creative and provocative as Ulysses was, it was still a novel of its time. You had to have a subject. In fact, that was the, one of the hallmarks of modernism, is a subject turning in on himself. In 20, 2008, Los Angeles, there are no subjects. There are only borderless cells in a borderless city. And we can talk about that in the discussion. Are you a borderless self? living in a borderless city. So I like that. Um, this is Michael Silverblatt of KCRW, if you've ever heard him interview an author, he's amazing. He writes this, dazzling and daze inducing La Medusa returns us to the amb ambitious, difficult, and serious work of Joyce, Elliot Poundstein, and Beckett. Like Joyce's Ulysses, La Medusa, is an investigation into the nature of experience. Los Angeles takes the role of Dublin. The brain and its double cortex generate the stylistic intricacies that the organs and senses do in Joyce. Let me say that again. The brain and the du its double cortex generate the stylistic intricacies that the organs and senses do in Joyce. So if you've read Ulysses, you know that it begins with uh, shaving, you know, and there's there's a lot at, uh, of ink spilled about this guy shaving, and and the rest of the <clears throat> novel is is very sensual, meaning based in the senses. Silverblatt says, um, and I I think I agree with him that for La Medusa, it's the brain that generates this sensory data, or, or I shouldn't say sensory data, just data. And above all, he writes, it is a female epic in which the swirling city universe is explored and shaped by the petrifying eye and intellect of the wily Medusa, her coiling locks extending everywhere. So remember, her hair's made of snakes, so lots of snakes around. So, why write this book? Here's what she says. I wanted to write all of Los Angeles because they said it couldn't be done. Because Los Angeles is a city of many camps and no core. Similarly, the fragmented nature of the book reflects Los Angeles as a fragmented city, the self as a fragmented memory, and the brain as a fragmented whole, which works in phase space or chunks that operate more or less simultaneously with more or less coordination between the parts. Thus Medusa became a place of plate spinning 
dashing between spinning narratives, and you'll get this if you read it, it's like jumping back and forth trying to keep this narrative going and this narrative going, with sufficient attenuation to let myself go further in the in-between. The in-between. This is very important to Vanessa Place. Um, so another thing she's doing here, she says, is ekphrasis, and you probably haven't come across this term. It, it's pretty simple. It, it simply means to tell out, and it's a form, it's a genre of writing that has to do with a <coughs> detailed and extended analysis of a work of art. She says La Medusa is an ekphrasis of the city of Los Angeles. It's a long and detailed explication of the city, except you don't leave with any greater understanding, at least in terms of consciousness or conceptual consciousness, but maybe in post-conceptual consciousness. In fact, she's an artist. This is an artist writing a novel, so she sees the page as a canvas. She sees, she says, the parameters as conceits. Uh, she says this in an interview in, um, at the University of Paris. My parameters, my variables, tend to be conceits. This is a literary term that means a, a large, fanciful device, right? Like, it, like hyperbole, but that's just one example. All right. My parameters tend to be conceits. Listen to this. This might explain a lot. <clears throat> Medusa, this is her, Vanessa Place. Medusa was dictated in parts by the parts of the brain represented. The choice of brain parts was, in turn, dictated by some obvious tropes, the language centers, for example, and some less obvious ones, um, wanting to, the sections to be half limbic and half cortical, she writes. Each section then became self-generative, in the sense that there were plot character language turns that, simply, that occurred simply as a result of the extended metaphor of that particular cerebral constraint. Emotions, particular thoughts, uh, language, etc. Two, there was the plane of the page, the P-L-A-N-E, using boxes or mirror frames. All right, so, oh, interesting. So remember those boxes you saw? Mirror frames, interesting. To enclose the skull passages, remember you saw that interior skull, um, and she says, up until those begin to break down and the seepage becomes apparent. <laughs> so this is also true in the novel. The, even the distinctions between these voices, these parts of the brain, begin to break down in the end and begin to merge. All that meant that the text had to be set in certain sized boxes, creating a variant of the lyric line break. Ah, that's interesting. So she's also a poet. So you know, if you've written poetry or read poetry, you know that the line breaks are extremely important. And, uh, well, extremely structurally important. So instead of line breaks, she wants to use these boxes that are also mirror frames, all right? And she says, these frames, or breaks, had to be constantly reconfigured as the dimensions of the page changed and as the text waxed and waned. The text as waxing and waning. All right, so how is Medusa Los Angeles? She says this. Part of it goes to the conceit, the elaborate literary device, of the Medusa which was the idea of the head that has many heads, right? So Medusa's head does have many heads, many snake heads. And so each one of these heads would potentially have a different genre, a different kind of writing, and it would be articulated in a different way. So you've got the many heads of the many characters, but then also the many heads of the different genres which is another narrative device or expository device, and it fits very well in Los Angeles, which is very decentralized, a many-headed kind of city. 
But also, she continues, to my mind, towards the end, there's an image of one thing. It's about the brain and the coils of the brain uncoiling in a Medusa sort of fashion. So she sees what she's doing there. The coils of the brain are the snakes of Medusa's head, and she wants to uncoil them. Well, if you do that, it gets really weird. Um, it gets into the notion of the subject, she says, and it certainly does. The subject, um, the self. A lot of traditional novels begin with the interior perspective, which then widens out to the world so that there's this notion of a single subject, like I was talking about with Joyce, that is encountering the world. Whether that's the protagonist that's cast in the third person or the closer I, the first person. And with Medusa, the idea was to invert that structure or reverse the structure. It starts with all these multiple ways of apprehending the world that then begin to maybe concentrate into a single subject, maybe. But the subject is a bit false because like Medusa, it's composed necessarily of all these other heads which seemed more accurate in terms of describing at least how I experienced the world. It's being less about, as you say, being colonialist, but less for me is the stain of striding out confidently and understanding and taking in and synthesizing versus there's a lot of information all the time and some of it is generated by me and much of it is not and some I retain and some I do not. It's about striding out confidently and understanding and taking in and synthesizing. Borderless selves. The interviewer at the University of Paris says this, I was tickled in La Medusa by the sense of frustration, and it is a frustrating read. Sometimes because you suggest a link, you, you write insert map of LA into the novel. She doesn't put the map in, she tells you to put the map in. The reader, insert map of LA, and there's no map. There's no insertion. Do you work from frustration to create desire maybe? Do you play with frustration? Interesting question. And Vanessa Place says this, again, very interesting. I like to set up invitations and temptations invitations and temptations, especially in my conceptual work. What I say in my conceptual work is that this is all about you. This has nothing to do with me. All these things are ways in which I'm feel, I feel I'm inviting the person who encounters the work to discover a little bit more about themselves and what they want and what their expectations are. So that the frustration is not my projecting a frustration onto you, this is very important, and we're gonna come back to this. When you see insert map, do you insert the map? Do you expect a map to be inserted? Do you want a map to be inserted? Is that the map itself? There's that part of it too. I'm interested in seeing what happens on the other side more. It's a world in which we can leave opportunities open. That book, this book, in particular, is very full. So what are the places it can open itself up to? And she notes with Marcel Duchamp, it is not what you see that is art. Art is the gap. If you're, if you're going to venture to read this novel, I would write that down somewhere and keep it in front of you. <laughs> It's not what you see that is art. Art is the gap. The gap between what? Between the art object and the subject. And what is in between that? Well, the whole world, right? So here's how, you might be wondering how she wrote this book. This is uh, from the examiner, in, uh, Los Angeles examiner. She calls it stupid it's the result of a stupid challenge. She says this, for about 15 minutes a day, for 41 days, I wrote whatever came into my head. Have you ever done that? 
I've done that. It's fascinating and a little troubling. Um, just don't try to create a narrative line. Don't try to do anything. Just record what comes into your head. You will, you will get this if you meditate, by the way. If you meditate, you're going to watch a whole bunch of shit parade right through your brain. Right? Imagine writing that down. Imagine writing that down for 41 days. And this is what comes of that. <laughs> and then I began elaborating on the bits and having, having a hobbyist's fascination for neurology, I figured that they would begin to knit themselves together in some sort of pattern or narrative, these pieces, these days. They did, but not like I thought they would. I had also heard repeatedly that it was impossible to write a Los Angeles novel about all of Los Angeles. That seemed a stupid challenge to me, and I very much like stupid challenges. Los Angeles, she says, is a city in your head. It's a city in your head. We've approached this idea last year and at times in this series. Los Angeles is an imaginative city. It's a city, it was born, California was born from a novel, a 16th century novel. Los Angeles was born from a 19th century novel. It is an imaginative city. It's a city in your head, which is somewhat different from, and yours, she says, is somewhat different from the Los Angeles in my head, and different still from the prototypical Los Angeles in the collective consciousness and unconscious. She says she wants her readers to make a narrative leap of faith. No kidding. <laughs> She says, I want to keep a gap or sliver between parts so that the reader will make the great narrative leap of faith that is otherwise absolutely unjustified. And that is what she really is good at, is, is making you conscious of the fact that you are making these leaps to connect these disparate items for no reason other than you want a story. And that's pretty brilliant. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this is Dan Godston. Vanessa Place is the kind of writer who could write about a flat white dot and make you go, whoa. Insert Keanu Reeves' voice there. Whoa. Though here the stage is wide as a vibrating city full of cops and pagans and ice cream vendors and rappers and the dead. So. Uh, I wanted to show you this. Um, first of all, to give you a sense of Vanessa Place, it's a video of her. And um, she's talking about a painting. So this is ekphrasis. This is elaborating and elucidating through words an image. And this will give you a good sense of her voice and also her artistic philosophy. And then we can talk about it. Gustave Courbet once said that he had a friend who would wake up in the night yelling, I want to judge, I want to judge. In 1873, Courbet painted La Tuit, the trout. The epimonious trout is hooked on the line and on the rocks, mouth open, eyes fixed, bleeding from the gills. It's dying, which means it's alive. The trout was painted between Courbet's release from prison, where he spent six months for his participation in the 1871 Commune, and his self-exile to Switzerland, where he died of drink in 1877, one day before the first yearly payment of a 33-year fine was due in Paris. It is the portrait of the artist as subject to the judiciary. I am interested in the position of the trout. Who owns the trout? And does the ownership of the trout depend upon what the trout is? Is the trout an image of the trout, the artist, or the fisherman who catches and is thereby also caught up with the fish? For that matter, should art ever be a matter of ownership? And is ownership the only path by which we recognize a claim of right? 
given that ownership, being as unfixed as right and as perspectival as history, seems too slippery a hook, too long a line. Given that the artist seems to own something in the work and the public owns something else and the next public another thing altogether. And do we believe that art is nothing more than an expression of the artist's personality or their most accessible biography? This seems a stupid question, but there's usually something to be said for stating the obvious. Is the artist a trout? If the artist is a trout only by virtue of being seen as a trout, then what is seen in the work of the art is not the work or even the worker, but its reception. Does reception then lie in the eye of the beholder? And which beholder? Who, in other words, is the trout beholden to? Almost platonically, then, does perception become reception? And is art only art that satisfies its recipients? Here we start to get into the recipient judge and the question of morality versus ethics. I would suggest that morality tends more towards the judicial, a law that has something to do with right, something to do with both truth and enforceability, whereas ethics is more structural and more personal, something that has to do with little with ownership or biography or truth and a lot to do with the lack of a fixed or even cognizable claim of right. Ethics are contentient, contingent, formal. Morality, contrarily, is choral, always right, already landed. And if we know that reception of art is not fixed, just as the object is not fixed, just as the notion of art is not fixed, then how do we account for our own historical contingencies, our own ethical contentions, our own choral demands? To put it very simply, the question seems to be no longer, what is art? But why is art? For insofar as art remains visible, it must be partial, ongoing. And if it is partial and ongoing, then it is a form of theater, a staging that includes the performance of itself at once done to be redone through its many great and small premeditated and accidental audiences, a continuation of time by other means in another space. The trout does not rot, though it is still red. The image is never a fact in this sense or a veridiction, but a gesture, like the gesture between le poisson and la passion, between pêche and pêche. Because a gesture is a performance, and a performance is a proposition. Art, therefore, is a question about a fish. So um, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't fill you in a little bit more about Vanessa Place, if you don't know. <clears throat> she, um, you know, I'm, I'm the one, like many of you, who would say art should make us uncomfortable. But when it comes to Vanessa Place, I want to say, whoa, not that uncomfortable. <laughs> um, for example, uh, sh a few years ago, she tweeted the entire text of Gone with the Wind um, with an image of um, the African-American actress, forget her name. Thank you, yes. So that's the Twitter image. And, and she tweets, it's a long novel. <laughs> and she tweets the entire thing, right? And people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> That's racist, and she's like, "Why do you think it's racist?" And so it's remember she said it's always about you. So she also, like I said, she she made art out of her her appellate briefs on behalf of child of sex offenders uh, who were already convicted and seeking an appeal. She made that into art. And then her latest project has been the rape jokes. So again, whoa, 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 not that uncomfortable, Vanessa. She compiled and even wrote a book of rape jokes. And she tells them, this is her performance art. She tells these rape jokes without apology, without context. She just says them. Um, and people, Understandably, understandably get extremely uncomfortable and I have to tell you I got extremely uncomfortable reading them um, just to give you an example one of she says one of her favorite rape jokes is 
if you don't like rape jokes, why did you come? <laughs> so, uh, she, that is Vanessa Place, and that is her uh, kaleidoscopic Los Angeles. Thank you for your attention.